Thank you for coming back, and thank you for being so cooperative about kind of shifting and juggling and leveling and all that good stuff, because, wow, I, I think we're actually all sort of in here without too many people hanging out the door, which is pretty fantastic considering where we started. Um, 10 o'clock in the morning is looking A-OK. -okay. You're looking pretty good. I hope we didn't stack the afternoon too badly in terms of what's going on. But again, if you, uh, on the schedule, have a little red mark on your name saying, oh, you've indicated you could take it by video, feel free to do it that way. Anyone can be looking at it by on the online videos. What we're doing is recording this session. I'll also record the third session. I kind of do a little editing to take out the mistakes and like make it seem like it all went right the first time. So uh, my secret and yours. So uh, we'll have all that stuff posted, but you're always welcome to come. And as space is available, you know, please make yourself at home and do all that kind of stuff. It's really just we try to squeeze ourselves in. Yes. Yes, they're out there too. In fact, I should just—they're they're on coursework. Yeah. So no reason to go like scratching furiously trying to capture all this stuff. Yeah. So that stuff's all out there too. Um, what else do you need to do? Load, lo no, logistically. I think everything's pretty much okay on the logistics side. Um, in access, don't worry if your sort of section in access doesn't match up with the time when you're actually attending. It all just goes into a big pool anyway. So it doesn't really matter what it says in access so much. Although in access, if you're playing around with a number of units, go ahead and get that as associated with what you need it to be. Because again, you can take it from two, three, or four units. And if you're taking it for only two units, then we should talk about when the assignments come up about what's expected versus four units and all that type of stuff. But um, make sure it sort of reflects what you need it to reflect for all your different limits for different types of fellowships and assistantships. And you know, we don't want to throw anyone over the barrel or you know, over the wall where all of a sudden you're paying twice as much tuition. You know, so we can adapt it. In fact, some people are even, if you can only take one unit and you're really up against the wall, you know, some people are just doing it as an independent study for a one unit and still trying to get it all in there. So there's a lot of flexibility to, to get it the way you need it to kind of fit onto your schedule. Okay, in terms of what's gonna be going on today, today's actually sort of a really kind of quick overview -y sort of session where what we're gonna do is just take you through the experience of creating a building model from start to finish. So we're gonna start with a pretty clean, fresh project and just build it up from scratch, adding walls and doors and windows and floors and put a roof on it take you all the way through the experience of creating views and putting those views on sheets and sharing them with other people. So it's really, we want to kind of within the two hours give you the whole experience from start to finish that we will then go back and unpack in more detail over the next couple sessions. So a lot of what I'll do today is, oh, let's put a wall in there and we're sort of throwing walls in there and not really paying a whole lot of attention to where they're going and how much sense it makes. But we're just trying to get the experience of working with the different building elements and get started with all that next Monday and Tuesday. We'll do that in a lot more detail and teach all the nuance and the different flavors of customizing things to really get what you want. So some of it may go by a little bit fast today. Don't sweat it in that we'll go back much slower and kind of give you all the, the important detail kind of in subsequent sessions. But today is really designed to be just kind of get, take you all the way through start to finish. So if nothing else, if you never, ever, ever come back, you at least could say, hey, I saw a building model being created from start to finish and you have some sense about how that would actually work. Okay, we're gonna be talking about building modeling and we'll distinguish that from CAD, again, mostly in the sense that as opposed to focusing on drafting and creating a bunch of symbols which represent the building elements, okay, we're gonna be placing things that look like real building elements. So as opposed to putting lines on a layer and because it's on a layer that says walls, we'll assume that line means it's a wall and then have to kind of keep track of that line and all the intersections of that lines with other elements. Instead of managing all that manually, we're gonna actually just be working with objects, things that are called walls and doors and windows and real things that you would find in a building. And as we do that, we'll place these real world objects and as we need to, we'll extract different views of the model. It's really all one cohesive 3D model and every view that we do, whether it's a floor plan view or an elevation view, is just a camera that's located somewhere relative to the model, and we're projecting that view. We're just sort of deriving it out of it. Okay. We'll add annotations to our views, things like dimensions and notes and things like that to sort of customize them and convey a little bit more information besides the raw building model. But the big thing is that, you know, we're working with real objects. That's the big thing you gotta kind of keep in mind. Okay. As we work with these different sort of optional objects, let's talk about what some of their affordances are. 
the objects all have a category assigned to them. So there is a wall category, a door category, a window category. And we can filter the objects based on their attributes. We can fil filter them based on uh, like what the category is. We can filter them based on their size or their material. We can select and decide what it is we want to show or don't want to show. So as we go through and create different types of views, we can say, for example, hey, this view is going to be for a structural engineering sort of perspective. I'd really like to feature all the structural elements, really draw them out with a heavy line weight and really emphasize them. And things like the furniture, I just don't need to be seeing in this view. So we can filter it out and make it go away. Okay. On the other hand, when we're doing an interior design sort of perspective on what's going on, we probably want to de-emphasize the structural elements and focus on the, uh, the furniture elements. And all these different views, we're going to be filtering things and kind of like controlling what is shown and what isn't shown. The important thing to keep in mind is all the elements still are in the model. It's just an issue of whether we're showing them or making them, uh, highlighting them or de-emphasizing them. We can control all that. As we create objects, we're going to start with sort of simple geometric sketches. But what's going to happen is real objects are going to come out of them. And as we create these new objects, they're going to interact in hopefully pretty smart ways. As we go ahead and have a wall and kind of get it close to another wall, They'll actually join with each other, and the intersection will be handled smartly. So we don't have to go through and do a lot of manual cleanup at that intersection. If the materials actually join, the, uh, the graphical representation will sort of clean itself up, and things will sort of hang together the way you'd expect them to. Similarly, with cutting, there's this whole notion, if we put a door or a window into the project, we don't need to erase the section of the wall that that goes into. You just need to put it in there, and the object will take care of cutting out what it needs to this is part of its own intelligence. Okay, so these objects really are pretty intelligent. We can also store data against the different objects in the model, all sorts of different data fields that would show up in a database. So for that door element, although we're primarily concerned about here from a design standpoint, its size and shape and maybe its materials, we could also store in the manufacturer, the cost, the URL for ordering it, whether it's been, uh, what its delivery date's gonna be, when it's gonna be constructed. We can layer all that information there. It's really just a big database of objects, of which we'll often look at it in these very graphical representations, but we can just as easily look at it tabularly. Okay, so it's just a bunch of data hanging around in the background. How smart are these things? They really do tend to function intelligently, and they respond smartly to editing. So if we do things like, for example, move the wall, the, the doors and windows will follow it. If we sort of change where the th uh, an object is positioned on a wall, the opening will move with it. We can flip things when we place doors, you'll see. When we put them in, if we're in the, in the wrong orientation, we can flip the hinging, or we can flip which side it's going to open to very easily. And they're very smart about doing things. We can also actually sort of build in some intelligent behavior in that when we connect different things together, they're understood to be connected. So for example, when we put a beam and a column together, we can say, really, what is that connection? Is it a moment connection? Is it a, a fixed connection? Just really, what is the connection between those things so that we can then do some structural analysis on it? Okay. Or if we're doing, for example, design of like oh, MEP systems, and we're designing an HVAC system, like an air conditioning system, when we put the different elements together, the flow through each of the different ducts is understood, the amount of capacity of the air handler is understood. So you can really do a systems analysis. And it's, it's not just a pretty picture. It actually has you know, the computational infrastructure underneath all there to really do the analysis and design a system. So they're really quite smart about what they're doing. How do we get started with all this? The key thing that I want to reinforce more than anything is that I want you to get used to the idea of modeling it like you're going to build it. Okay, so let's think about what that means. In the world of lines, you can sort of make lines do most anything you want to. So it's not really all that critical whether you know, it joins nicely or if that line's behind it or in front of it. You can sort of fake a lot of things just with lines. When we're modeling it like we're building it, Okay, we're actually going to think about every time we join something, really, what is that very specific condition? Which face is it joining to? You know, how tall is that object? So for example, when we're placing walls, you're going to see that we have this choice. Do we want to them, place them from the ground level up to the very roof of the building, or are we going to place them one floor level at a time? And your overall guideline should always be model it the same way it'll be built. So if your construction system is such that we're going to build a level then put a floor in, then build another level, then put a floor in, model it that way. 
Um, for other things like a tower, maybe we're going to build the whole structural system from top to bottom and then put a big glass curtain wall across the facade. That you would model that way. So think about the construction operation and then sort of parse up your model the same way and think about the connections the same way. So don't fake it is kind of the big important thing to keep in mind here because although you might be able to get it look good in, to look good in your views, if other people are using your model, they actually count on those things being connected accurately so they can do their analyses or their takeoffs. So just really be thinking ahead. And I'll warn you, that's actually going to sort of force us to think a little bit differently because as designers, if we're only sort of concerned about the appearance of things, we may be used to being a little bit loose about how these things are going to get built. But now you're actually going to be asked to think about not only what's it going to look like, but how you're going to build it. And that puts a little more responsibility on you right up front. Okay. The good news is we can do things at a sort of a very granular or sort of high level of a uh, very coarse level of detail, I should say. So you don't have to get very specific at the beginning. You get finer and finer as we understand it. Okay. But even from square one, we need to have some sort of assumption about how the things are going to connect together. Okay. And as we get started, another good thing to keep in mind is that you always want to start with the right template. And let's talk about that. Here's the deal. When you just open Revit out of the box and sort of, say, create a new model, um, it gives you sort of a very bland template that has some things in it, but there's not really a whole lot in it. So you can pull in different sort of wall types you need and different windows and doors and all that stuff and kind of build it up yourself very organically. But what happens is, very quickly you start realizing, you know, I always tend to work with the same types of walls and windows and doors, and it's usually based on the types of projects you're used to doing. If you're doing residential construction here in Northern California, like I do a lot of, you know, there's certain wall types and assemblies we work with, there's certain sort of standard doors and windows we work with a lot. So it's worthwhile to kind of have a template that has some of those things predefined into it so they're very easy for you to access. You don't have to kind of keep recreating that from scratch. Okay, so along that line or in that same spirit, I've set up a template for us to work with today in class that already has some things loaded into it so we don't have to create it all from scratch. So let's start by just opening that and we'll like uh, get going, okay? So what I want you to do is, if you haven't opened it yet, open means well, except for what's going on over there. Fantastic. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and find a document called Session 2 Starting Point. And the way I often distribute things like this is I put them out on coursework. So if you can, open up coursework in the background there and log in. Of course, it helps if you put in the correct password. There we go. And where I'll tend to distribute things is in the materials folder. Actually, let me go to the correct class and then go to the materials. Then under session two, you'll find. Actually, there, there's the slides for today's class, the getting started with BIM modeling. And then right underneath it, this Revit starting point, .rvt.zip. Go ahead and click on that and bring it on down to your machine. Okay, and keep track of where it goes because we're actually going to need to find it in just a second. So by default, it usually puts it in a downloads folder. It might put it on the desktop, something like that. An important thing to note about that file is it's zipped right now. We put them in these little zip archives, and the reason we do that is when you send things around over the internet, a lot of email programs, a lot of virus checking programs won't know what a .rvt file is. It'll assume, hey, this might be dangerous, and block it. Okay. Whereas zip is considered a pretty safe format for transferring things around. So when you download a zip file, no problem, it'll come down just fine, but we have to unzip it to kind of get the file back out of the archive. So I've downloaded it. I'll pull down here. I'm in a Chrome right now. You might be in something different. See if you can find that document. And what you want to do is in Windows, you can right click on it and say Extract All. Put it in a folder instead. You really want to unwrap that folder from around it. And the folder will hang in there. The, the confusing thing about all this is if you take a zip file down and you put it on your machine, and then you go into Revit and say file open, it'll let you even look inside the zip file, but when you try to open it, it just won't open. It'll keep on, it won't open. It just, you open and it just doesn't open. And you sort of get very frustrated by this. 
And that's your sort of clue that, oh, maybe I need to unzip this thing. So back out to the Finder, or not the Finder, um, Windows Explorer, and like uh, do a little unzip. Make sure it's no longer a zip file, and then what you need to do is open that file instead. So get used to that notion. When I pass things around, I usually zip them first. Okay, so see if you can find that. Oh, all event, let's see. Well, let's just open it up there. Have most of you been able to download it? Okay, let's see if we can get you everyone into Revit. If not, I'll put it into like uh, out there on the, uh, the L drive. We'll say open. And then you have to go ahead and find wherever you put that thing. I actually know where I have it hanging around in here. So see if you can find that session two starting point and say open. And get to a point that looks somewhat like waiting. Okay, looks something not like that, like this. Okay, and really what is this? As opposed to just being the default one, all we've really done here is I've set up a couple of different named levels. I've kind of adjusted where the cropping is on some of the views and loaded in some nice wall and door and window types for us to work with. Okay, but there's really nothing all that special about this. It just has some things preloaded into it to make our life a little bit easier. Okay, so let's check in where you are. Do most people, are most people able to get this thing open? Yeah. Not yet, no worries, work on that. It's opening. How are we doing on my funny little blue machine? Is it okay? Excellent. Okay, back over in the corner. We doing good? Excellent. Oh, still not? What's it telling you? Okay, let's just take a look and we'll get you caught up so that we don't lose you right off the front. No worries. Um, do you still have Internet Explorer over there? Try downloading it again. Okay, so we go back in over to Revit. Let's see if we can find it. So over here, it's trying there. Oh, I'm betting it's in here. And then how about documents? Not in there. Um, in here. That's my documents. Where is downloads? In there. There you go. Yay. Oh, no worries. It's, it's only about like eight layers deep from where you want it to be. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at what we got here. This is really just it's a workspace. It's a, we're looking at level one. I put some grid lines in there. This is sort of a property line indicating sort of the boundary of our space. What else? This is sort of a crop line. Well, that'll be important when we start placing our views. But it's just basically a workspace. It's kind of hanging out waiting for us. So let me give you the overview of what we're going to do with this. That is as follows. Come on, wake up. There we go. We are going to go through a series of steps where we're going to build our simple building by first drawing some walls and sketching them in the floor plan view. We're then going to add some doors and windows to our walls by placing some objects from the library. We'll put a floor into our building, we'll put a roof on our building, and then we'll sort of package that all up and say, hey, it's a building for today. So that's, that's the overview. That's, a, that's basically the procedure for doing a lot of this stuff. So rules, wall, door, window, some things that look like building element names. So what we can do is just look at any of these different elements or the different tools. Okay, choose the tool. For example, let's just choose the wall tool. And when we do choose the wall tool, let's look at what happens. Every time we open a tool, we get sort of a customized sort of set of things happening in the ribbon that are really related to that. So this tab says place the wall. And in the place wall tab, you'll see that we have oh, some drawing tools. We have some tools for drawing straight lines, rectangles, kind of very regular uh, geometric shapes, circles, arcs, all sorts of different stuff. Okay. We have the notion of really what type of wall it is. And let's kind of pull down on that menu for a second to sort of see some of the things that are available in there. You'll see that in this template, we've defined a lot of different types for you. There's some, oh, exterior brick on CMU. There's sort of a generic four inch brick wall. We have some interior wall types. Each of these are different assemblies, different thicknesses and types of materials that are all layered together. Okay, and as we go through and place our walls, we like to choose different types to indicate sort of how thick they should be and what the materials will be made of. 
And it's okay if we actually choose the wrong type. We can always go back later and change the walls type very, very easily. So how about for right now, why don't you choose, choose generic four inch brick? That's a good starting one. It'll show up there in the ribbon as our selection. Now, as we, or if you check down in here in the options bar, we have some options that'll sort of control how this wall is placed. One notion is, is the wall unconnected? Okay, and currently by default, it's set to be unconnected. If you draw a wall, it's gonna be 20 feet tall and kind of just, you know, poking up out of the ground. Okay, 20 feet may be a little bit, you know, it's not exactly what we want for our walls for this little one story thing. We can say unconnected and sort of enter a specific height or an explicit height. Or what I actually like to do is instead do something a little parametric. Instead of just letting it float to an explicit dimension, choose roof level one, okay? Choose roof in there. Okay? And if you choose roof, what's gonna happen is rather than drawing something 20 feet tall, you're gonna establish a relationship that says draw it as tall as it needs to be to hit the roof level. And the nice thing about that is if the roof level changes, the wall will change with it. So I'm gonna keep on encouraging you whenever possible, don't do things explicitly, tie them up as sort of different relationships and locking things together because that'll give you a lot more power in the long run. Okay, so go ahead and choose roof. Yes? Level, level one's just the ground lower level for us. Okay, and even these names are really kind of arbitrary. I might just be able to, I should probably change that to just be like a f you know, floor level or something like that versus roof level. Yes? If we keep level one, what will happen? Then it'll be from level one to level one. So it'll probably complain when you try to draw and say that, oh, this wall is too short. Okay. So in fact, it's quite, you can even do this thing where you sort of have walls that are upside down where the top of the wall is below the bottom, and that happens too. So watch out for that. Now, it'll, it'll warn you when you try to do that. Okay. So I'll choose roof. Go ahead and just grab the little, like, uh, drawing tool. Oh, let's give you one more thing you have to worry about. That's this notion of wall center line. Let's talk about what that does. As you draw a wall, you're drawing a single line. Walls have real thickness, though, so you get to choose really where your wall will appear relative to that line. Centered on it, on the inside, or on the outside of the line. Okay, and we'll talk a lot more about the subtlety in some of these choices next time, but for now, wall center line's probably fine. But that's what that choice is about. Okay. Grab a single line tool and just try dragging on out. Click in the drawing area. Just give yourself, oh, and on, don't worry about this too much. Just give yourself some nice shape to work with. Notice as you draw your walls, the dimensions are being indicated. When I close it on up, it'll sort of give me some little uh, indicators that that's lining up. See if you can draw some nice walls like that. Okay. Again, don't worry too much specifically about your shape. Now, an important thing to know as you're drawing these walls is although we're drawing this 2D representation of them, we're actually creating a 3D wall. And if you want to see that and sort of understand how they work together, what you can do is open a 3D view. You can do that by either clicking here. This will open the default 3D view. Or you can come up to the top right here. There's the, just another shortcut for opening it. Try clicking that, and you'll get the 3D view. And if you would like to see these two things side by side, so you can sort of see the plan and the 3D thing together, we can do something called tiling the different views. So just kind of put them right next to each other. And to do that, what you do is you'd switch to the View tab. And then way over here, they have this tool called tiling the windows. So if you want to, ch open that, choose that, and you'll see things sort of show up side by side. Now, as some of you are doing that, let me comment that for a lot of the commands, there's little kind of keyboard shortcuts to get you there. So for example, Tile Windows has this little WT. That's a two-letter shortcut. If you type that, it'll have the same effect as though you navigated your mouse around and like uh, chose it from the ribbon. So I'll say Tile, and then I can do a little panning to get that into place. There's my 3D view. And here's my 2D view. Okay, and if you don't believe that they're fully hooked or you want to test it, go ahead and choose any of the different objects. And if you choose an object in either of the views, it'll highlight in both of the views. Okay, and then you can start dragging it around a little bit. So try, just don't drag that over here. Now I'll pull that over here. 
just go ahead and be very free about this. There's really, there's no way to go wrong. Okay, so you can go ahead and draw all sorts of interesting shapes. Let me kind of draw another shape kind of behind the house just to kind of just demonstrate some more of the drawing tools that are available. I'm going to draw another set of walls. This will also be using the home tool or home tab. Choose the wall tool. And I'll stay with the brick for right now. I can draw a single line. But then as I work and place that one, I can change to a different drawing tool. For example, I can switch to the arc tool and then sort of draw here to here and sort of pull out an arc to make a rounded surface. Then I can switch back to the straight line tool and join that. You can really sort of combine the tools together in whatever way makes the most sense. Now as you go through and place your walls, okay, they are removable. There's no problem in sort of changing any of those. For example, if you would click on a wall, for example, this wall, some little temporary dimensions will pop up in the floor plan view. It shows that it's six foot six from this wall and nine foot six from that wall. And if I would like to change that, I can either drag the wall, or if you want to sort of put a precise numerical dimension in here, you can actually just type like eight feet, and it'll move it on over. Okay, what you do is select some element. Well, I'll select this one instead. And as soon as you select the element, some temporary dimensions should show up that throw it its position relative to the adjacent one. Okay. Then if you click in either of the blue kind of dimensions, then you can enter a numeric value. Okay. We'll explore that. Let me put some interior walls in here, then we'll go back and explore that in a little more detail. Okay, now for these walls, these are all these generic four inch brick walls and generic four inch brick walls are okay if that's all you want to build with, but you probably have some more interesting wall assemblies in mind. And if you'd like to experiment, you could choose a wall and say, let me change its type. Oh, so let's do something a little more appropriate to uh, like uh, construction here in Northern California on the campus. Let's change it to like a stucco wall. And if I change the wall type, Notice it changes over here, has a nice little surface pattern too. Also sort of changes over here in the floor plan view, and it even has a different thickness now. It's no longer four inches thick, it actually has the appropriate thickness for that wall assembly. So go ahead and try just changing some of your different walls to different types. Maybe I'll change this one over here to be, oh, like the, maybe I'll do the uh, shingle wall. can't see the shingles very well, but that's really just an issue of scaling. If I zoom on in there, you get a slightly better sense that the shingles are there. Or if shingle doesn't really sort of you know, meet your needs today, we can go through and change it to another wall type, for example, wood siding. Okay. But you have complete flexibility in terms of going through and changing these walls. So it's OK as you're getting started. Just put them in as generic walls if you want to but know they're generic and that you're going to get more and more refined and start making real materials choices as you kind of keep on pushing down the process. Okay, so walls are just one type of element and you can choose different types to kind of change their properties at a high level. Okay, let's go ahead and try the whole notion of that height and really what it meant to sort of lock things to level two. If you want to, you can open up one of the elevation views, for example, the south elevation view. Doesn't really matter, either any of them will work. You'll see that we actually have a 2D elevation representation of your building floating around in that view. And if you click on the level line, I'm gonna click on the roof level line, I get a dimension. It's currently showing that those are separated by 10 feet. If I want to change this to, for example, 12 feet to make it a little bit taller, I can. And let me do that again, just so you can sort of see it. It's eight feet. Watch, if you can, what's happening back here in the 3D window. I'm gonna pull that out of the way a little bit so you can see it. So there's eight feet, it's nine feet, it's 12 feet, okay? So that's the power of locking it parametrically, as opposed to just saying it is 10 feet, give it that, because very often, um, late in the project, you'll decide that someone wants a higher floor-to-floor -floor level, Maybe as we're doing our building, we realize we need to have a higher floor-to-floor -floor height to accommodate all the HVAC equipment and the structural layers. So 
you know, give yourself the ability to do that without having to redraw all the walls independently. How did you get that elevation view there? Okay, what I did, let me close it up and show you again. It's down in this section of the project browser. Any of those elevations will work. Let me do it from the east elevation instead. See if you can open that. Just double click to open it. And then choose the uh, level marker. And then you can go through and just uh, click on the blue dimension and change that to what you want. Yes? Yes. Is that only if it's locked? Actually, locked is sort of a different notion there, because it's actually locked is doing a funny thing for you. See that lock? It's actually, it's not that the wall is locked. That lock is indicating this. Let me show you this. It's just that for these level markers, if I pull them in, the ends will move together. So you are right, locking is sort of the essential notion, but the wall, the reason the wall is locked, let me show you that, is that if I choose the wall and I look at its properties, it's going up to level roof. That's what's locking that piece. But no, you're right. Pay attention to the locking, because that's really where the secret of behind all this stuff is. It's really it's paying attention to what's locked to what. So we have these walls. We can go ahead and change their heights. That's just fine. Now, if the world was all exterior walls, we'd be in great shape, but we need some interior walls here too. So let's go ahead and add some interior walls into your space also. Again, going back to the wall tool. We'll change to, oh, I have some different interior wall types set up for you in the template. We have these partition walls. The partition walls are all about kind of metal stud walls with gypsum board on the outside. Then I have ones that say gypsum board on two by four, two by six studs. Those are more wood frame walls. I'll just choose those two by four studs. And I can just come over to the floor plan view. Again, pay attention to sort of what the height is set to right now. And just start drawing walls to subdivide the space. Now, as I place walls, you'll notice I just kind of go really quick and just sort of map out the approximate layout of the space. And even in practice, that's pretty much what I do. I start by just sort of getting the walls down, because you can always choose the walls and then adjust their dimensions later. Okay, So I tend to just get the geometry down first. I have these interior walls. Again, if I want to start changing things, I could click on any one, and then I can start changing the dimensions. So if, for example, this one over here wants to be at 6 foot 9 from here and 6 foot 9 from there, if it wants to be 6 feet from there, I can just type that and the wall will move up. Now let's kind of talk about this notion of selecting and which wall is going to move, just so you get a sense of how, this, how you know, important it is to uh, you know, select the one that you do want to move. For example, right in here, oh, um, that's not a great example. Let me try this one. Well. I guess I'll stick with here. What's going on is we have this notion of really which wall you want to have move. Actually, now I'll put another wall on. I'm going to give you a better example because that's going to sort of confuse things because of the corner. I'll put another one over here. Pardon my fumbling. Here we have this notion that this room is 7 foot 9 wide over here. As we go through and we want to change that room to, for example, be eight feet wide, there's a couple of ways we might do it. If we choose this wall and we say that it wants to be eight feet wide, notice what happens is that wall is the one that moves. It made the room that wide by pushing the wall to the right. And let me do that and make it a little more dramatic so you can sort of see it. I'll say that it wants to be 12 feet wide. It's going to push it way over there. And the reason it's doing it is it's saying, when you select it, you're saying, OK, given that I'm giving you the flexibility to move this wall, make this dimension true, so it'll push that wall to make that dimension happen. OK, let's go ahead and do it the other way. If instead I choose this wall, and I say make that room eight feet or 12 feet wide, it'll push that wall instead. Okay, so. Keep in mind which thing is the thing that you're giving it the flexibility to move, because you always want to be able to select that one and then make the change. Okay, yes? If you have, uh, like, for, for the external wall, if we want it at a certain distance from the boundary, yes. and I don't want to change the, complete the inside dimension, yeah. so the whole structure has to be shifted, then what is it? You want to move the entire structure? Yeah. Oh, no worries. 
Let's show you that. What you can do is just do a big, uh, let me see if I can get to it. Hang on, with my little one finger control here. I can select all the walls. So let me even get that little, uh, out I'm, I'm gonna get rid of the outside building because it's just gonna sort of bother us in a second. I can select all those walls by dragging around. Okay, and then I can push the entire assembly around to wherever I want it. Is that sort of what you had in mind? Oh, no, okay, no worries, we'll do that too. Let's see, well, let me kind of show you a specific dimension thing here. We're there. I really want to get a dimension line down to help that. You know, I, I know exactly where you're going. Let me show you another thing, then we'll get to that one, okay, which is over here. Okay, we got these dimensions hanging around, and these dimensions are pretty useful to us. We can go ahead and select one of these guys. This is what's known as a temporary dimension. It only kind of exists as long as we have that wall selected. If you want to sort of encode a more permanent relationship between some walls, you can click on this guy over here, which changes the temporary dimension into a permanent dimension. And then it'll actually, that dimension line will stay around. It's still hanging. Okay. And then with that dimension line there, we can still go through and change the values. Let me do this. And I could say make that eight feet. Okay. But that dimension line still still hanging around. The advantage of having the dimension line hanging around is that you can lock things to that dimension line. For example, if I choose that dimension line, you'll notice I get these two little locks that are set up right here. So for example, if I know that I want this dimension to always be seven foot three, I can lock that dimension. And if I lock that dimension, what happens is if I move this wall, we'll move together to always maintain that relationship. So locking a dimension means that you're you know, fixing a relationship between two different things and always kind of keeping it the same. Okay. Now I'm going to show you another sort of variation which is very similar to sort of uh, what you have in mind, but it's, uh, it's a little bit tougher because you have the whole group. Over here, well, if I know that I want those to be, oh, let's say three feet, I can put that in there and put that wall over there. Another variation I'm moving, and again, don't worry if this is sort of getting a little deep for some of you, because it's really, we'll, we'll get to this in a lot more detail, is we can use the move tool and say that we want to move something, then enter a specific dimension that we want to move it, and just move it a specific piece. But what we ultimately want to do to answer your question is group the whole thing and move it relative to that. So I'll take that up with you, just because I think it'll confuse everyone if we do it at once. Okay? But no, it's a, it's a perfectly valid thing to do. Okay. So how are we doing in terms of just having some, uh, some walls? You got some walls floating around in there, some interior, some exterior walls? Okay. If you're looking good on walls, let me give you just one last variation on walls that a lot of us like to have in our repertoire. For example, let me choose this wall right here. And I have all these very standard wall types that we like to work with. But if you pull way down to the bottom, you'll find everyone's favorite, curtain walls. So you can choose oh, something like the storefront curtain wall and just very quickly change that wall into a series of uh, glass panels and mullions. And we'll spend a whole part of a session just talking about how we can adjust that grid spacing and mess around with all those panels to make them exactly the way we want them. We can have them all glazed. We can have some solid and some glazed. We can put doors in them. Curtain panels is its own separate little subject. But just to show you some sense of really how quickly you can change these walls, let's just choose that curtain wall. And we can look at its properties. You're going to find that everything's all about choosing things and changing their properties. One thing we can do is start, for example, change the angle at which those grids appear. So right now they're all set at zero. They're perfectly vertical. If you want something a little more elaborate, you can change it to a specific angle. And the grids will all start appearing at some funny offset. Okay, So we can change the spacing. We can change the angle. We can do a lot of things. We can change the materials, the mullions. But for now, just know it's out there. There's all these things that we can do to play around with grid panels, but they're really, they're just another wall type. That's all you need to know about them at a real high level. Okay, we're feeling good about walls. Okay, if you like walls, we'll move on to the next piece, which is 
Doors and windows. Okay, now, doors and windows are a little bit different. With walls, what we did, we, we sort of sketched where we want the wall to be, and boom, the wall would appear based on the type of the wall. Doors and windows are, they're examples of things where we're not going to sketch their shape. We're going to sort of choose some predefined shapes out of a library and place them. If you have four doors and windows, I got a 30 inch door, I got a 32 inch door, I got a 36 inch door. They're, they're sort of a finite set of them. Okay, so we can choose some of those things as components out of a library. The nice thing about components in libraries is that they're very shareable because they exist sort of outside the project. So if I got a great door and you want it, I can give you the file and you can load it into your project. Or if you find on a manufacturer's site a fantastic door or a window or some piece of furniture <coughs> that you'd like to use, they'll often have a component family there that you can load into your project and you don't have to kind of recreate all those things from scratch. So this whole thing about components and sharing components is huge. It saves you a lot of time in terms of modeling. But doors and windows are typically the first place you encounter it in what we do. To illustrate, let me do doors first. I'll zoom on in there just so I can see a little bit better. Try switching to this home tab. Yeah, question. Going back to the how do you make like once it's already here? Yeah. That's kind of a good one. Do you want it to continue to sort of maintain a relationship or you just want to get rid of it completely? Yeah, I'm trying to get rid of it completely. Just backspace it. Oh, it'll even tell us we're going to unconstrain because we're going to remove a constraint. Another way to do it, just so you know, dimensions are actually only view specific. Okay, if you just don't want to see it in that view, you can right click on it, and there's this thing about hiding it in the view. So that's a way of maintaining the relationship, but just not looking at it. Okay, but watch out with that, because that's how you, you can sort of leave trouble for someone downstream if you have a whole lot of uh, constraining dimensions in there, and they're hidden, because then people have a hard time figuring out what's going on with your model. Okay, so. Uh, it might be better to have two different views, one that has the dimension showing and one that doesn't. And that way, when you want to see what the constraints are, that'd be a better practice, I'd say. And we'll show you how to do that a little bit later, too. Okay, let's go to the door tool. When you go to the door tool, if you come over here to the type selector, you can scroll on down and see all sorts of different doors that we've loaded into this template. We've got some double flush doors, single panels. We've got some glass doors. Some panel doors. Panel doors, oh, they kind of look like those home doors. They have little inset raised panels. We have single versions of these. Let me go for that single glass door. I'll start with that one. Maybe 30 inches wide by 80 tall. If I come over to my floor plan view and I hover near a wall, notice the door will appear there. It'll suggest, hey, okay, I could kind of host myself right into this wall. And if you want to accept that, put it on in there. put it on in there. Notice as you're putting them on in the floor plan view, they're also showing up in the 3D view. Let me come back over here. I'll orbit that around a little bit so you can see that better. There they are. So I can place doors in there. And once I've placed the door, if you click on it, you'll see it has a couple of little controls on it. It has this control, these arrows that point in and out. That's to flip the door to the other side. We can also use this control to flip the hinging direction. Okay, so don't worry if your door sort of goes in at the wrong place. We can always move it around later. And just to show you how it works in a little more detail, when you place the door, well, let me zoom in even closer so you can get a sense of what I'm up to. As I'm placing the door, if my cursor is sort of above the midpoint of the wall, it'll go to that side. If it's down below the midpoint of the wall, it'll go to that side. So you sort of get to choose. But you could always flip it later if the choice wasn't right. I'll put that one over here. Try to get something where at least all the doors don't bang into each other when we open them. OK, now, these doors, these again are just sort of like uh, this is the 2D representation. Here's the 3D representation. Actually, here's a case where I'll talk about the objects being smart because they're representing themselves nicely in a floor plan view. They're representing themselves nicely in a 3D view. They'd also look nice in an elevation view. Doors, because they are sort of type driven, you can change the door types just by selecting one in any of the views. And if you select that, 
Oops, where'd it go? There it is. Yeah. Hang on. Choose that door. I can choose a different type. If I'd like that to be a solid door instead, I can change it to that. Or, for example, I'd like this one to be that kind of panel door. I can change it to that. So this whole world of components and types is actually pr it's pretty easy for most people to work with. People tend to get the idea of components and types very nicely. You pull things in. They have sort of different geometries to them. You choose a type associated. You, know, you want the right family to give you the right style, whether it's a glass door, a solid door, or a panel door. And then you choose a type within that family to choose your size. Okay? And then all that's pretty much the door story. The door story is pretty straightforward. Let me show you a variation on that story. Let me take a door. I'll put a double door just on the outside of that building. Let me go to the double glass door maybe 72 inches wide. And I'll put it over here. Now, if 72 isn't the size you want, and 68 isn't the size you want, and you know, isn't the size that you want, you can take any of these types and duplicate one of them to give them a, a size that you do want. OK, that makes sense? That's a bad way of saying it, but let's show you what I mean. I can take that door. And I can look at its type properties. The type properties are where the dimensions are defined. And you'll see that currently the width of the door is set to 6 foot 0. If I needed a 5 foot door or a 4 foot door instead to fit my application, rather than changing this one, I'd like to keep the 6 foot one around because I might need the 6 foot in some cases. I want to create a new one that's 4 feet or 5 feet wide. What I'll do is I'll just duplicate this type. Again, if you're following along with me, what I'm doing is selecting the door saying type properties, and then I will choose this one and duplicate it. And then I can give it a new name, something like 48 inches <coughs> by 82 inches. Now that's just the name, the name that's going to appear in the list. That doesn't actually enter the dimensions. To actually change the dimensions, I need to change it right here, changing the width to be 48 or 4 foot 0, however you want to look at it. And when I say OK, I have a new size available for me in the project. So creating new sizes is actually pretty easy. We can create new sizes of doors. We can also create new sizes of windows. We'll see in just a second. So that part's pretty straightforward. And as long as you're pretty much sticking with the same basic geometry, the same basic layout and materials, you'll just work within a single family of doors. What we're going to show you when we actually do doors next week is that if you have other door types that have arches on the top or exotic folding wall doors, will load in different families that have that geometry and start customizing their behaviors. Okay? But you know, I've loaded these few types within our little project as our template, but you could always go out and load more or go to manufacturer sites and load in theirs too. Okay? And you know, so phew, no painful drawing to kind of figure out all these different things. It comes as part of the door object. And because it's part of the door object, if I, for example, go to one of the elevation views, it's there. It's got its swing lines. Everything's happy. Or if I'm in the elevation view and I'm changing things, for example, changing from that 48-inch door to the 68-inch door, I change it once in the elevation view. <coughs> it's going to change it in the floor plan view, change it in the 3D views. Because you're really working on one model, just different views of the same model. OK, let's throw one more topic out on the table before we take our break, and that is Windows. And the reason I'm going to throw it out really quickly is that you already know how to do Windows. I can leave you alone for three minutes, and you'll figure this out. Because really, it's just like doors. The only difference between doors and windows are doors or windows don't have the same sort of swing. They don't hinge the same way. And windows tend to have this property about where their bottom and their top is, the sill and the head height of the windows are. Okay, but it's going to work the same as we've done the others. We can choose a window type. For example, I got some fixed windows. I got some uh, casement windows, some double hung windows. Let me do a double hung. That's a very familiar type to a lot of people. Let me uh, orbit this around a little bit so we can look at the back of the house. I can put some windows in here. 
And as I put the windows in, you'll notice they're actually showing up. That one's complaining at me because I put a window right where the wall joins it, <laughs> which is not a very smart thing. But not to worry. If I make a mistake like that, I can just so easily slide that window over and correct that problem. Okay, So I can put windows into the project very easily. Now this notion of head and sill height, if you choose a window, you can see it in 3D, but I actually like to place them in 2D so I can control this a little bit better. They have instance properties. There's a sill height and a head height. Those are actually two related values, because if the window is four feet tall, whatever I put here, this will always be four feet greater than it. So just choose whichever way you want to control it. If you prefer to think of it as seven foot at the top, it'll adjust it to three foot at the bottom, or vice versa. Okay, so go ahead. Try putting some different windows in, because I think you're going to get the hang of that just fine. Let me put another window in here. Those are sort of double hung. Let me put in a casement window. A casement window, like a nice double casement. Those are good looking windows. To kind of swing out, catch the breeze on a hot day. That'll be good over here. As I put them in, oh, I can put them in the floor plan view just as easily. Let me go over here. I'll choose a single casement window. And I'll put one on this wall. I'll put one on this wall. Actually, let me sort of zoom, move that over so you can sort of see what I'm doing a little bit better. Now, you should know windows actually sort of have a notion of the inside of the window and the outside of the window, because sometimes there's a different trim on the inside of the outside. And oh, what is, as you place it, you tend to sort of pull towards the outside of the window. Okay, But if you ever get a window that's flipped over wrong, no worries. Just choose the window. The arrows also appear on the outside. You can flip it the other way. Now, that won't affect you most of the time. About the only time you'll ever sort of see the effect of that is if your window has trim and you're trying to render it, because you'll get sort of the wood trim on the outside of the building and the painted trim on the inside of the building, or vice versa. You know, so you gotta just keep track of that. But windows have a size to them too, or side to them too. Okay. But that is, in essence, the window story. So get the windows in there. There's different families of windows. We could change the sizes the way we change the door sizes. We can come up with different, we can have arch top windows and combination windows that have transoms and all sorts of different things by loading them from the library. But that's the essence of the window story. So rather than diving into all that in detail now, let's do this. Let's stand up, take a break. Go ahead and like, uh, please stretch, <coughs> get some air. Come on back in about five minutes. Okay, and we will continue with floors and roofs and how to put these in views. <laughs>